And raise your hand if you like ice cream. All right, this applies to everyone. So my name is Kelly Lampkin. I work for Oracle NetSuite, and I love ice cream. I have been at Oracle NetSuite for over six years. I specialize with our software and technology clients, but I work with all of our vertical customers, retail, manufacturing, wholesale distribution, FinTech, even you name it, I probably work with them. I travel to over 22 countries in one year across five continents for NetSuite to evangelize our Suite Success program, which helps our customers move off of QuickBooks and onto NetSuite Cloud in under 100 days. But today, we're not talking about that, we're talking about ice cream. In order to talk about ice cream, you first have to talk about ice, right? So who has seen the movie Frozen? Okay, so the movie Frozen is actually a very accurate depiction of the ice harvesting industry. So we're gonna go through a couple slides here to, from the movie to explain the process. And little did you know, maybe, that the ice industry in America in the 1800s was one of the top 10 industries providing the economic status of America and during that time. So first, we've got to wait until winter. So you only have a couple months during which you can even harvest the ice. You have to wait until the ice is thick enough for you to stand on it, and then also for horses to be able to stand on it, because you need to have the horses draw the grid lines and etch that into the ice. Next, you have to saw the ice into cubes. This is extremely labor intensive. It would take between 10 and 100 men over 10 hours a day, seven days a week, and very often they had to work at night because that was when the ice was at thickest and it hadn't melted very much. After you saw the ice into cubes, you would float them down the stream and then they would be picked up by an assembly line. The assembly line would pack the cubes of ice into straw and hay and then bring them into an ice house. These cubes of ice can weigh up to 300 pounds and they'd be stacked up to 80 feet high in the ice house. At the end of the day, only about one-tenth of the ice that was harvested ever got to be sold. So, it's very, a lot of work that you have to come into to get a cold drink, and this is all even before you can think about how you're gonna turn this ice into ice cream. So, let's talk a little bit about the ice industry, because an entire industry of companies came around the concept of transporting, manufacturing, bringing, carving ice, all of it happened in a whole entire industry during the 1800s. So in 1806, a man named Frederick Tudor is a very wealthy Bostonian. He's having a luxurious picnic at his home in Boston, and his brother, and here discussing, they're having ice cream at their picnic, by the way, because they have a lake in Boston where their servants have collected some ice for them to have as a family. He discusses with his brother, what if we sold ice in the Caribbean? What if people in the Caribbean go crazy for a cold drink? And as a joke, Frederick's brother bets him that he can't sell ice in the Caribbean. So Frederick takes this bet, and he decides he's gonna try and sell ice in the Caribbean. No one will put ice on their boat and bring it to the Caribbean. No one believes this is a good idea. So he buys his own boat with his family money, $5,000 at the time, and brings 80 tons of ice to the Caribbean. No one understands what it is, it doesn't, his company fails. So he ends up in debtor's prison for the next couple years. After he is released from prison, he decides to try again. So this time, he thinks, well, I have the supply. I have all this ice at my family lake in Boston. What I don't have is demand, so I have to become a marketer now. So what, what Tudor does is he goes around the country and he tours different restaurants. He teaches bartenders how to make cold drinks with ice. He gives the ice away for free, so the bartenders will use it in their shops and see what customers prefer, if they prefer cold drinks or if they prefer warm drinks. He then teaches restaurants how to make ice cream to create demand for more ice so he can sell it to them. He goes to hospitals, he tours hospitals, and he shows how ice could be used to reduce fevers in patients. So he does this whole marketing campaign around the world. It works. By 1819, he's, he, by uh, 1826, he needs a partner to be able to cut the ice to manufacture it for faster. So those horses that we saw in the beginning, that was invented by his partner to be able to draw the grid lines and manufacture the ice much faster. After that, he ships over 180 tons all the way around the world to Calcutta. This is a four month trip by ship. He proves, when it gets there, that it's still frozen, that this is possible now for the ice business to be completely globalized. Then we meet Nancy Johnson. She invents the first manufacturing of ice cream for commercial use. So it's an ice crusher. It can crush the ice for drinks and then also enables people to be able to make ice cream much faster. Then we've got over 150,000 tons are shipped to over 43 countries in 1856. This is now a global business, and by the turn of the 1900s, 
we have one of the top 10 businesses in the American economy. We've got 90% of households in the United States have an icebox, and deliveries are as common as milk, about three times a week. Then just 30 years later, we invent refrigeration and freezers, and this whole industry is dead. It melted. <laughs> so the ironic part of this is that the demand that Tudor created for the ice cream is what ultimately led to his own demise because the demand for ice cream created a lot of innovation around creating freezers and creating refrigeration, which would ultimately lead to artificial ice, which would ultimately lead to ice cream and no more need for the ice industry at all. So the ironic part is he actually led to his own demise by creating so much demand and not pivoting his business to accommodate for the change that he had created himself. So let's talk about ice cream, because that's what we're here to talk about. Ice cream has long fascinated us, right? Julius Caesar was one of the first people on record to have used ice cream. He would have a runner run into the mountains and collect ice for him, bring it back, and put some honey on it. You've got, you've got all kinds of people throughout history. There's even an account of um, one of the English kings had a chef that would make him ice cream, and he bribed him not to give the recipe to any other of the noblemen, so you would only be able to get ice cream at his palace. Then you also have George Washington. He was reported to have a $200 bill for ice cream over the summer that he became president. So we had all of these people who used ice cream in a very luxurious way. And then as ice became easier to manufacture, as artificial ice became more common, new industries abound. The old industries of the ice carving and ice distribution business are dead, but new industries can emerge. What about you can um, move food all the way across the country in a refrigerated car? New diets are able to be made. New recipes are able to affect all of America. You can preserve meat better. The spaceship has a lot of refrigerated technology, so the United States space race was fueled in part by refrigerated technology. Research and medicine for diseases is also powered by the ability to refrigerate. And of course, we have the economy that we love so much of ice cream. Today, ice cream is available to everyone. Americans consume over six gallons of ice cream per year per person. And then, of course, your Instagram feed is flooded because ice cream is not only, of course, a treat, but it's also an art. And so your Instagram is flooded with the San Francisco Ice Cream Museum right down the street. So what do we learn from this story? Frederick Tudor was an innovator. He was an entrepreneur. He was the beginning of his time. He created an entire industry. And thankfully, he died before he saw it all melt away. So he died very rich and had no idea that the industry that he had created would crumble. But what about all the people that supported that industry? What about the people who created the devices, the carpenters and the welders who made the structures for the horses? What about the architects that designed the ice houses? What about the laborers that had to cut all of the ice? What about the merchants and the sailors that delivered all of the ice across the world? All those jobs don't exist anymore. New industries were able to come about, like ice cream. You can take, because the ice cream industry did not build around ice. They built around how you could take ice as a utility and transform it into something new. So the companies that survived were the companies that took the raw material and made it into something disruptive. They didn't build their business around the material. So my question to you is what kind of company do you want to be? Do you want to be an ice company or do you want to take ice and make it into something disruptive and innovative? So a couple companies are going to flash by here, and if there's millennials in the room, they might not even know who they are. <laughs> so 52% of the Fortune 500 companies from 2000 don't exist anymore. More than 50% of the leading companies of the world less than 20 years ago are not in business anymore. This is an example of the modern day ice company. We don't have, the companies were not able to compete. Technology and competition made them obsolete. These companies were ice companies. So how can NetSuite and Box help you? You don't want to be an ice company, right? No one wants to be an ice company. We don't want to be out of business. We want to be ice cream. So leverage technology like Open Air, like NetSuite, like our products, like Box. And these products are going to be able to help you to grow your business without worrying about the back end. NetSuite is an accounting application. So what we can do is we can reduce the amount of effort that you have to do in manual spreadsheets reduce error, reduce risk. All this happens in our cloud so that you can focus on your business. And your business is something disruptive and creative and amazing, and we'd rather have you channel that energy from a tactical process to a strategic mission. Box is the same thing for you, right? You're all Box customers here. You don't want to be in the data management business.
let Box handle your data for you so that you can focus on your business. And together with NetSuite and Box, you're able to track all of your transactions down to the source code from NetSuite into Box. So NetSuite processes a sales order from Salesforce. NetSuite processes a receipt, a payment order, a purchase order, an expense report, a timesheet, even a resume. All of those transaction level details drillable right to the source in your Box account. So what Box and NetSuite want to do for you is help you be whatever flavor of ice cream you want to be because you don't have to worry about where the ice is coming from. Let technology here use that and leverage it in your business to be strategic.